Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Spring Church. My name is Austin. If you're watching online, welcome here in the room or in the North Auditorium. We're so glad that you guys are here. We have an incredible service planned for you guys today, and uh, we're kicking off the service by acknowledging and celebrating Mark and Mary Alice, our lead pastor and his wife, 35 years of faithful service here at New Spring Church for Wichita, Kansas, to see God's word go out to all of the world. And uh, I could sit here and talk a lot about their story, uh, but that would, that would take a while. That would be about 35 years worth of a story. So we distilled that down into a couple minutes in a video for you guys who don't know to learn a little bit more about their journey to this point. This weekend at New Spring, we're celebrating God's faithfulness and honoring 35 years of ministry with Mark and Mary Alice Hoover. It all began in 1985 when the Hoovers felt God's leading to move away from their family and home in Texas to take a position in a growing church in Wichita, Kansas. Mark's leadership at church was evident from the very beginning. Within a few years, he became senior pastor, and as the church continued to grow, God opened some very significant doors to allow the church to move to a beautiful and convenient location on the corner of K96 and 21st Street. Mark and Mary Alice invested their hearts and souls into the city of Wichita and the surrounding areas. And as they did, God opened doors for a more expansive ministry through radio, television, and internet. Mark's challenge to the church was to touch the whole world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The new location provided fresh opportunities with increased visibility and easy access. And as New Spring continued to pursue its commitment to minister to the world, new avenues of ministry were developed. Judgment House, Starting Point, Kids World and Family Ministry, Missions, and Bible Distribution were just a few. Over the past 35 years under Mark's leadership, New Spring has grown from a few hundred to over 10,000 who either attend in person or watch remotely each weekend. As lead pastor, Mark has led through some very joyous and fruitful times, as well as some difficult, even seemingly devastating times. In each circumstance, he trusted God's leading to answer every question. This body of believers called New Spring Church has felt the blessings of God in so many ways over the last 35 years, especially through the amazing leadership of Mark Hoover and his wife, Mary Alice. And as Mark would be sure to remind us, the best is yet to come. Yes, will you join me in saying thank you to Mark and Mary Alice. Aren't we blessed to have such leaders as Pastor Mark and Mary Alice? I know I'm, I am so appreciative to have them as our pastor and first lady and the fact that they have dedicated their lives as husband and wife to spread the gospel, the simple gospel that we should all be striving to dedicate our lives to. I know me and my wife, we've made the uh, commitment that we would live our lives and rid ourselves of religious ways or things that we grew up um, that we were taught that were man-made, but that we rid ourselves of those religious ways and get back to the simple gospel. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. So I'm laying down all my religion. I'm laying down. I want to know you. I 
happy in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of financial struggles, infertility, whatever your issues, your burdens are, how can you be happy? Yes, those are very real circumstances, very real things, but we serve a very real God who is over all of those circumstances. If you're a child of the king, he's walking through that with you. He's ahead of you. He's behind you. He's within you. And Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. When you have the strength of the Lord dwelling within you, and you know the promises of God to his children that I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. You start to look at things a little bit differently. We are called to be set apart from this world. And if our circumstances begin to dictate how we react and respond in the world, the world is not going to see Christ in us. He is glorified through our weakness. In our weakness, he is made strong. And so it's not that I'm walking around saying everything is good, but my God is good. And that's why I can be joyful in the middle of hardship. He's still good. Whether you're in the room or you're watching online and you need to hear some encouragement today, our God is over all. And it's okay to mourn because he comforts those who mourn. He is close to the brokenhearted. So we can be real today about what's happening in our lives and we can still choose to worship a worthy God. Faith like a child. I love this song. As a kid sang it. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Oh, you don't know? <laughs> down in my heart. Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Yes, down in my heart to stay. Now, as a kid, I got a lot of lyrics wrongs to a lot of songs. I still do as an adult, but I used to think it was Tuesday. Uh, here in my heart, Tuesday. And only on Tuesday, that was the joyful day. And then I, I started getting closer and it was today, uh, but that would, that would mean that maybe yesterday I didn't have it and tomorrow I might not, but it's to stay, to stay, to stay, to stay. So I'm gonna be joyful. Doesn't mean that everything's all right but I serve a worthy God, and that's why I can sing this. Give me joy down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Yes, you, you give me joy down deep in my soul, unmovable, down deep in my soul, unshakable. You know it. Let's sing it out right here. We know that there's beauty in my broken. Thank you, Jesus. I've got true love instead of pain. And there's freedom, though you've captured me, yes, Lord. And I've got joy instead of mourning. Sing it out, say you give me joy. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul, yes, Lord. Down deep in my soul, down deep in my soul. Listen to me now. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord, all your promises. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your Never been so free, caught in your love for me. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. Yeah. I've never been so free, caught in your love for me. Yeah. I've never been more secure, knowing your heart, Lord. 
hands, we're gonna stomp our feet, we're gonna dance a little bit because we really believe that the joy of the Lord is our strength today. So clap your hands with me just like this, come on, say. It's so good to see you today. Please go ahead and have a seat for just a few moments. This will be the only time I'm on stage in the service today. I'm really enjoying sitting out with Mary Alice. I don't get to do that very often, although I'm not very experienced at it because last night in uh, the Saturday night service, uh, I, I guess I brought my phone with me. I usually leave it in my office and I forgot to silence it. And while Pastor Johnny was preaching, my phone rang, or at least I got a push notification. And I thought, oh, that's how it happens to me when I'm speaking. So I just want you to know it happens to me too. Um, I want to just say something real quick. Uh, you know, this uh, c celebration was originally planned for ju June, but then the coronavirus came along and it got pushed forward to October. But I'm just so grateful uh, to have the privilege of celebrating with you today because one thing that's been very clear to Mary Alice and me is it's not just our celebration, it's all our celebration. And I have the joy of pastoring the greatest church in the world. I have the greatest staff in the world. And God is so good. And and uh, so I'm, I'm, we'll save that maybe for later, but I just want to say this to you. Now, when the team here was putting this together, they reached out to me and they said, who would you like to bring in uh, for the special celebration? And there was a question about, would you, you know, like your favorite, like, I mean, I love Third Day, so they were talking about something like that. And, and I said, well, you know, I appreciate their ministry so much, but what I love most is I love our people. I love, I love the people who lead us in worship. And I just feel like this is a celebration of our church. But I said, what I'd really love, if you want to know what I would love, I would just love to have a night where we can get together and just worship the Lord. Because if there's any explanation for 35 years, it's the grace of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I thought, I would just love to get together with you where we lift up the Lord with our worship team. That's tonight at 6.30. So I know some of you are not quite ready to return. And, and it will be streamed, but you know, there's something about worship that if you're watching online, it's a concert. But when you're here, and I'll just say this, I mean, no one should do anything they feel uncomfortable with, but there is power in worship and our nation needs the power of God tonight. I mean, more than we need the stuff this world can provide, we need the power of God. We better get it quick. I'm not gonna preach, just, it's not my week to preach. Uh, but I thought about it. Uh, but while I'm up here, I, and that's not 6.30, so please, if, if, if you feel comfortable being here, I, you just won't want to miss that. Um, while I'm up here, I want to introduce um, a special guest. Um, when, uh, when this was planned, I knew that there were two people who would understand our world uh, better than anybody else. Because it's, it's interesting, when you've been someplace a long time and you've watched God grow it from a small church to a great church, there's just so much... And I knew if anyone understood, it'd be Johnny and Janet Hunt. And we're so grateful to have them. Uh, pastor Johnny was a longtime pastor of First Baptist Church in Woodstock, uh, which is in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the greatest churches in America, one of the largest churches in America. He was the two-time president of the Southern Baptist Convention. But mostly what he's known for is his love for pastors. He started Timothy Barnabas, which is a teaching and training and encouraging ministry to pastors. I believe it was 26 years ago. And today he trains and teaches thousands and thousands of pastors around the United States. And he is in the ministry, my very best friend. And so I'm so thankful that he's here. But here's the thing. A pastor's wife is a really unusual role uh, because she goes 
right along with the pastor and everything he does, except I'm reminded of the most famous dance team in history. It's from like the early part of the 20th century, the middle part, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And everybody gave Fred Astaire the credit for being this great dancer. Ginger Rogers pointed out that she had to perform every step that Fred Astaire did, except backward and in heels. And I think that's, that's a great description of the pastor's wife. And, and for Mary Alice, she has been such a help to me because so often, you know, here's the thing. In a great church, if it, a lot of people have the idea that, that you know, greatness comes because it's just, it just sort of happens. And I do know this, God blesses. But guys, I'm going to tell you something. It's always a challenge to drive change. And so, so often, if there was just an area that needed to be worked on, I would ask Mary Alice, would you just take this on? And it's not something that she would choose. And it was always a challenge because whenever change happens, all of you who drive change, you understand there's always going to be complexity that you got to figure out. And there will always be a little bit of conflict that comes with change. And so I've watched her through the years. And, and then, of course, as God grew our church, other leaders came along and went through the same thing. Dan and Debbie Kubish, Billy Poor, and others who just led by being willing to do whatever it took to make change. And I knew this. I knew if anyone understood Mary Alice's role, it's her best friend in the ministry. Would you welcome, please, to our platform, Miss Janet Hunt, longtime First Lady, First Baptist Woodstock. Thank you so much, Brother Mark. Standing back here on the back of the stage, you hear things a, a little bit muffled, a little bit different than you do sitting out there. Have a little bit of a hearing problem anyway. And standing back here, I heard Mark introducing me and Johnny to do a dance like Fred and Astaire, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. That's a little scary uh, to my husband because he knows I would do it. Um, if Mark were to say, okay, she's going to come and do a dance and her husband's going to join her, I'd say, well, here I am, I'm ready, but Johnny, not so much. It is such a joy and a great privilege to be able to stand before you on behalf of pastor's wives throughout the country to congratulate Mary Alice Hoover in 35 years of ministry here at this great church, New Spring. So congratulations, Mary Alice, on behalf of us other people like you. Now, Mary Alice is an extremely intelligent woman. She's always a step ahead of all the rest of us. I mean, we only got to serve 35, 33 years at our church, and she's already been on 35 and she's so smart, a lot smarter than me. But I wrote a poem for Mary Alice, and it goes like this. Mary Alice had a little lamb that could have been a sheep, but when she joined New Spring Church, it died from lack of sleep. <laughs> that is exactly Mary Alice in my eyes. She's always going, always doing, there's always something wonderful to tell me about. Working with pastor's wives throughout the country, I consider Mary Alice to be the model pastor's wife. But nowadays, words mean so much more than just what you hear. So I thought, well, I have to be politically correct, so I better look up that word model and see what it means before I tell everybody she's such a model pastor's wife. Well, to my surprise, it actually means a small imitation of the real thing. Now, Mary Alice, you are not a small imitation. I mean, she is just big as life, bigger than life. And she is not an imitation. She is the real thing. Mary Alice, you are the perfect example of a pastor's wife and what we would all desire to be like. And also, yes, applause worth, applause worthy, yes. And then also, Mary Alice has such a warm personality. I just love being with her. She's always upbeat and has something fresh to say. So I look up warm. That was a mistake. Warm personality means she's not so hot. But she is. She's hot. Mary Alice, you are hot. You are not warm. You're everything. You are hot to trot. <laughs> I love you dearly. <clears throat> and then one last thing. Actually, I have two last things. I'm moving my preacher. No, one, two, three. Okay. Number two, last thing. My husband loves to close, and so do I. Um, but being with her is just the best day ever. Now, I had a um, 
etiquette expert tell me that when you address an envelope to a husband and a wife, you put the wife's name first and then the husband. It would be Mary Alice and Mark Hoover that you don't separate the man's last name because he's always Mark Hoover, but she has changed most of the time, taking on her husband's last name. She had a maiden name, so it's Mary Alice and Mark Hoover. But in verbally addressing Mark and Mary Alice, it's not natural to say Mary Alice and Mark Hoover. It is Mark and Mary Alice because Mary Alice is not out there in front of Mark somewhere doing her own thing. She's right behind her husband, right beside her husband, sometimes giving him a little push on the back to encourage him to move on forward. But she's right there with him behind the scenes doing the work that God has called her to do. Mary Alice, I applaud you for these 35 wonderful years of service and can't wait to see what God has in store for you in the next 35 years. I hope I'm around to to watch it. God bless you. Congratulations. And thank you so much. Thanks for being with us today. Here are a few things we want to let you know about. We aren't passing offering buckets today, but it's still easier than ever to give to New Spring. Just visit newspring.org slash give or download the New Spring Kansas app on your mobile device right now. You can make a one-time gift or set up an automatic recurring donation. This year marks 35 years at New Spring Church for Pastor Mark and Mary Alice Hoover, and we're holding a night of worship on Sunday, October 4th to celebrate. If you'd like to share your appreciation for Mark and Mary Alice, we invite you to join us for this special evening as we reflect on the impact of their incredible ministry and worship God together as a church family. Even if you can't make it in person, you can still be part by tuning into our live stream. Learn more at newspring.org slash night of worship. Join us for a first Wednesday prayer service this Wednesday, October 7th. In addition to prayer, we'll worship and take communion together. We'd love to see you there. Our service begins at 6.30. Couples, come enjoy a date night with a purpose at our Married Life Live event this Friday. You can learn about these events and more at newspring.org. Thanks for joining us today. Well, good morning, New Spring. And let me put my personal invitation to tonight. Uh, I sat through a five-hour practice on Tuesday for the night of worship. And you do not want to miss it. There is no football game on TV. There is nothing on the tube that is going to take place of what the night of worship is going to be. It's going to be an inspiration to you. We're going to worship our Lord and Savior. And also, we're going to honor Mark and Mary Alice. And I've sat through it. It is going to be amazing. So don't miss it. And the greatest thing is, it's free. We're not even charging for it. It's free. So make sure you come tonight. Well, it's my privilege to introduce to you our speaker. You heard Mark talk about uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt. And I first heard Johnny speak at a mission conference in about 1993, drove down to his church, and I was just amazed how well he can communicate and the passion he has to reach lost souls around the world and how he touches so many people. But the greatest thing, personally, that Johnny Hunt has ever done is to become the best friend and a pastor to our pastor. So with that said, would you please welcome... Dr. Johnny Hunt. Well, thank you very much. And to say it's an honor to be here is the understatement of the new millennial. It is uh, really a joy to be here. Now, the challenge uh, that before me is to really passionately desire to do two things in particular. Number one, to glorify our God, and number two, to honor a pastor and wife that's given 35 years of their life to you. And then on top of that, to do the same one three times looking at them. Uh, Mark told me earlier, he said, gosh, I appreciate what you said. I don't know that I'm deserving of it, but I can't wait to hear it two more times. So anyway, I'm glad he's (laughs) delighted to hear it. And uh, did you know the average pastor in the United States serves six years in his church. Your pastor and wife have served you 35 years, over three decades, three and a half decades of their life. 
And I mentioned, and I believe it really is true. It really would be true. You've given the best years of your life here. You've raised your children here. I was looking at that that young couple that came here 35 years ago and those two little children thinking the third was born here and they've served and um, they're so passionate about what they do. So really Mark and Mary Alice are our BFFs. I mean, we love them and we thank God for them. And so I wanted to honor them, but I'll be honest, I wanted to biblically honor them. I wanted to make mention of what the Bible says about a minister, his ministry, and his message. And so if you have a Bible with you or you've got your Bible app, I really would appreciate it if you would follow along with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read the first seven verses, but verse number seven is really one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. It really speaks of what God does when he changes a person's life. And it's just a wonderful Wonderful point. And by the way, I'm glad they're saying a lot about tonight. Uh, We scheduled our flight a day later just so we could be here tonight. So I'll just be honest. If I come and you're not here, I'm going to be ticked off. No, anyway, I would love for you to, to come. As Pastor said, if you feel comfortable. He sent me the last night of worship y'all did together. And it so ministered to me. So I really wanted to make that part of our trip here as well. Second Corinthians chapter four, beginning with verse one. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose hope, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. And then he goes all the way back to creation to talk about the gospel. I mean, in Genesis chapter one, and he says this, for it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then my favorite verse in this passage simply says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. <clears throat> Many of you through the years have picked up a devotional that your pastor contributes to that we do with Thomas Nelson, the largest Bible publisher in the world. And when we get those, sometimes we're asked to sign them. And I always sign with my favorite verse. And I want to commend Mark and Mary Alice for the way they so exemplify the truth of this passage. It's Proverbs chapter 20 and verse seven. The righteous man walks in his integrity and his children are blessed after him. So as we exemplify the life that Christ has placed in us, we influence our children. Uh, Not only has it been a joy to be with Mark and Mary Alice, but we love Jonathan and Jared and Stephen. And I want to just mark, point something out that I've noticed, I've observed, and I've reflected on a lot, but I've never told you. I've never been with you that one of your boys did not come in. And I've seen it happen Friday night when we were with you. It happened this morning. It happened yesterday. And one of your sons will be there. And before they leave, you will look at them and say, I love you, son. And it just really resonates. I mean, they're grown men, but we never get over uh, loving them. And what a joy for those of us that are in ministry to watch our children observe us, not just the, the commitment to ministry, but listen, we've mentioned it a little, the conflict in ministry, and then them desire to spend their life doing the same thing their mom and dad did. What a testament Uh, to their integrity in serving with the Lord. So your pastor and wife 
Mark and Mary Alice Hoover have been close friends to Janet and me for the last 10 years. So I want to speak both from personal relationship as well as careful observation of their life over these decades. And so as an introduction, and it's kind of interesting because it's a long introduction, and it'll leave a few minutes for the heart of the message as well, but this is still heart of the message. I want to highlight some things about Mark. I want to highlight, first of all, Mark, your ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that we read just a moment ago in verse number 1, and you've been taught this, but it says, therefore, which always causes you to ask the question, well, I said, therefore, it's always referencing back to what he said in previous chapters. So he says, since we have this ministry, and over and over again in chapter 3, it refers to the ministry as glorious. I mean, this is not just ministry. God has given Mark a, and Mary Alice a glorious ministry. And he says, as we've received mercy. And when you think about mercy, always remember this. It is God not giving us what we deserve. And, and then on the other side, it is grace. God gave us what we did not deserve. And he said, now, as a result of this, we do not lose Heart. It means there's things that come our way that could cause us to cowardly give up, uh, to unstring the bow, no longer be effective or useful. But he says, we do not lose hope. Now, when we think about the ministry God has given Mark, he magnifies it in chapter three. Now, I need you to really pay close attention for this reason. What I'm getting ready to read is about you. I mean, I didn't just come to honor Mark, I came to honor you. This has been a relationship, a pastor and people and a testament. And the truth is without his staff and without the way you have engaged ministry, we would never have the testimony of New Spring that we all enjoy. So here are the words. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others uh, letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our letters, you're, you're our epistles written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. That is our heart. And so what he's saying is that the great testimony is here. It's not that we have letters from others or letters from ourselves that commend this ministry. You are his ministry. Uh, God, when he changed your life, wrote something, not on hearts of or tablets of stone, but of hearts of flesh by the spirit of God. And we're gonna talk about that even more in just a moment. Here's another way that Paul said the same thing using different language in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming? Here it is. For you are our glory and joy. First text I had. It came before I woke up this morning. I'm an early riser. It came from Alabama. Preacher's in trouble. Can you call him this afternoon? Can you recommend him somewhere? Yesterday afternoon, Charlotte, North Carolina. I need somewhere to go. Would you recommend me? You know what I love about your pastor? He's, he's got eyes for you all only. I mean, he just loves you. You are his crown of joy. Listen how he said it. He said, is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? New Springs is a large church. Even in the context of COVID, there is a lot of people in the last three services. Let me tell you something I know about your pastor, and this is very important. His major passion is not to see how many seats he can get in these seats. His desire is to see how many souls he can preach the gospel to that can spend eternity with him in heaven. And that means a great deal. You see, when we love our people, and he and Mary Alice, all they do is talk about y'all. Get so tired of hearing about y'all. <laughs> but they're constantly just telling us what God is doing in your life or whose life God changed or who started coming. I mean, even last night, I'm, I'm sitting there and I've just got to tell you this. And, and Mary Alice just said, 
no pressure, but I've been trying to get someone to come for years and they're coming because it's our anniversary. No pressure, but they need to hear the gospel. And I'm thinking, no, no pressure. So, but they're really concerned. That's the bottom line. They don't want to just see you from Sunday to Sunday. Are y'all listening? They want to spend eternity with you. And uh, that's a long, long time. And so here's the bottom line. You are their ministry. But let me say a word about Mark's message. It says in verse three of 2 Corinthians 4 that I read, but if the gospel is veiled, one, one translation says if the gospel's hidden, it is, it is hidden to those who are perishing. We've got to be faithful to the gospel. It was said of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Someone said to him, Mr. Spurgeon, why is it that every sermon sounds so much alike? He said, oh, I'm glad you noticed that. I take different verses, but after a few minutes of translating that verse, I make a beeline for the cross. I mean, so really what's most important, you know what we actually teach as Christians? Have you ever said this? The single most important decision you'll ever make in your life is the day you surrender your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I was with Mark and we were in Houston and we went to visit a pastor on his deathbed, an evangelist by the name of Freddie Gage. Freddie Gage recommended me to First Baptist Church Woodstock over 34 years ago. And Freddie Gage gave me a statement. He said, it'll help you to preach the gospel with greater compassion and passion if you will realize that eternity is too long to be wrong. There's some things you may not get right, but let me tell you something you need to get right. The gospel of Jesus Christ and to know him is your Lord and Savior. So the Bible says the God of this age has blinded the minds, wait a minute, of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine to them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And so I'm grateful that Mark's message is the gospel. You know, I've been here on numerous occasions to just spend time with them. And so I would be here to hear him preach. And I love the way he gives the invitation. He did the same thing at first Woodstock on the times that he's preached for me. But at the end, he would always give a clear call to the gospel. And he would say this, the blood of Christ is the currency with which Christ paid for your sins. That became very memorable. You know, I, I wanna preach the message with passion each time, not just from memory. And so different things uh, come to my mind. And I was studying the other day. You, you know one thing that disturbs me about a Christless eternity? Let's just go ahead and say it. It's not used enough in our pulpits anymore. You know, you know what disturbs me most about hell? First of all, I don't think anyone ever intended to go there. But number two, my Bible teaches that in hell, you will be cognizant. You will, you will have a conscious awareness. The Lord Jesus Christ told a story and said a man went there and then he allowed Abraham to speak to him and he was tormented in flames and Abraham said these words to a man in a Christless eternity. Son, remember thou in thy lifetime. And I believe immediately he would have never asked him to remember if he didn't have the capacity to do it. And I can't imagine being an attender at New Spring or those that watch this church online every week and realize that you'll go out into eternity. And one of the things, if you sit under Mark, I think that will ring true all throughout eternity is the blood of Christ is the currency with which God paid for your sins. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ paid it all, all to him we owe and Christ made a way in your pastor. Thank you, Mark, for being such a gospel preacher. But let me say a word about Mark, the minister. But you gotta catch this. Remember, I wanna do a balance here. I wanna honor Mark, but I'm telling you, I know Mark wants to honor you. Uh, the statement was said many years ago, and it, it's, a, it's really sort of a question. Does a great pastor make a great church, or does a great church 
make a great pastor. I just want to be honest with you. I believe a great church makes a great pastor. When you follow our leadership and you love the word when we teach it and you desire for yourself what we desire for you and what the Bible teaches is that which we ought to assimilate into our lives, man, it makes ministry good. Matter of fact, you know what your pastor says about ministry? He says he loves serving you so much that it's narcotic. I'm concerned about him. <laughs> narcotic. And, but the sad thing is, I know exactly what he's talking about. I mean, it's in the Bible, it talks about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, it talks about being addicted to ministry. So pray for your pastor's addiction. He find serving you and the Lord narcotic. So I'm glad I've picked up. I know what Mark is thinking now. Did you remember any of the other things that I said? So we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Your pastor and wife last year made their first journey to Israel. Uh, Janet and I have been there on numerous occasions and we just love everywhere we go in the land of Israel. But we always enjoy the day that's going to take us down to the Dead Sea. And when you're going down to the Dead Sea, you're going to make a stop and you're going to see a community that's pretty well preserved and it's called the Qumran community. The people that live there were referred to as the Essenes. They say they're confident that John the Baptist used to minister there among the Essenes. And some even believe that Jesus may have visited there. But let me tell you what will happen. As you're making your way down to the Qumran community, the bus will make a sudden stop and it'll point to a cave in the side of a mountain. And in that cave, guess what they found? The Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest manuscripts of God's word and the most of the manuscripts of God's word ever found in one place. Guess where they found them in that cave? In a clay pot, in an earthen vessel, in the exact same word that he's listed. Uh, I, I, I wanted to research it so I could make sure I got my illustration correct this week. I've heard the story so many times. A shepherd that found them, he didn't know exactly what they were, but he knew they were valuable. Guess what he did? He sold them for $175,000. Somebody says, man, that was great. Well, sort of. Where are they today? They are in the museum in Jerusalem. How much are they worth? Priceless. Absolutely no price could purchase them. They're worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. He uses the same word, and he, he doesn't just say, I put scripture. This is good. I know what I'm going to say, and I, it, I'm thinking about it. I'm getting excited. So I'm glad I came so I can hear this. So the bottom line is, here's this container, and we think, oh, my stars. They placed sacred scripture in it. But here's what I want you to know about yourself. If you say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are an earthen vessel. And that's why one day, guess where you're going? Back to the earth. And here's what the scripture says. God placed an incalculable, valuable treasure in you, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the good news is when he placed him in you, he said he'll, he'll never leave you and never forsake you. That may not mean a lot to you, but I was raised by a single mom because my dad checked out at seven. So when a father leaves and then you get a new father, it's it is really good news to know that he promises that I'll never leave you or never forsake you. Adrian Rogers put it this way. When Jesus Christ comes in, he wants you to know that your heart is not a hotel. He doesn't check in and check out. He's a permanent resident forever. He's going to live inside of you. And so we have this treasure. So here's what God did. God took an earthen vessel by the name of Mark Hoover. And he placed himself in him. But guess what? God is no respecter of persons. He placed in you the same thing he placed in Mark. And so God can use you. You'll be part of a vision that he cast for this church until God calls him home. 
But the neat thing is God will also give you a vision of what he can do with your life to make a significant difference in other people's lives. Well, let me get through one of my major points that I wrote in addition to my introduction. Let me talk in our time together about the commitment of Mark, God's servant. And there's three areas I want to just mention that's listed here in the Bible about a minister, his ministry, and his message. First of all, Mark's commitment of his walk with God. Um, This is a great statement. Mark walks with God. He really does. He's not just out there with human speculation trying to find out what God would will to do in the future in this fellowship. But instead, he walks with God. He's asking God, help me, speak to me, show me. He, he's, he's such a teachable, precious brother. He's always saying, what do you think about this, Pastor Johnny? I'm thinking about this. The Bible says he's renounced the hidden things of shame. Uh, that speaks of that which is disgraceful and honorable. Hey, can I give you um, a little test for the future? The next time you turn on the news or you read a headline in the newspaper about someone that we expected so much more of, and I could name some right now that have been in the paper, I mean headlines in the last few weeks. Adrian Rogers said that any time you look up and you see a falling star, before you become so overwhelmed with a falling star, look up again and thank God for the, the billions that are still in the place where God placed them. And so we could say, oh, I could call names. They're right on the tip of my tongue. My heart has been broken. I minister with some of these ministries where people have brought embarrassment and humiliation to the name of Christ and Christianity. But this speaks of dark, hidden, private, hip, hypocritical lifestyles that we move away from. Uh, There's a verse I used in my men's conference last year that speaks of this. And listen to it, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, and so I I love to define what it means. So in a great house, it would have been the temple, it would be our churches today, in a great house. This is a great house. They're not only vessels of silver and gold, but also there's vessels of wood and clay. Uh, Some for honor, my life, dishonor. But therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be a vessel for honor. That's us. That's your pastor. God will make you a vessel of honor. Um, He will make you a a vessel of mercy. Um, Sanctified. God, God cleanses us and then sets us aside. And listen to these words, and useful for our master. Is is there a passionate desire in your heart since you came to know Christ that that deep down inside you'd like to just say, God, please, in Jesus' name, cleanse me and make me useful for the master. Uh, Mark was talking the other day and he said, I want to talk to you about some things that get me up every morning. I'll tell you one thing that'll get you up every morning. I'm getting up, and I don't know when COVID's going to end. And I know everybody wants to talk about what you can't do during this time. But here's what I want to say. God, even in the midst of something that certainly didn't take you by surprise, I like to quote Sam Cathy. Since God is sovereign, has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? That was good. Hey, Mark, do you ever have this thought? Well, the band was up here. and Austin does such a great job. I just love that kid. I put something out there on social media to his mama. She was just with us last week, Miss Anita. <clears throat> but they can have the guitar and sing a word and say something. And everybody just applauds. And a preacher's just got to work so hard to get any response. And I just thought a minute ago, I wonder, I wonder if he'd let me use this guitar. <laughs> And maybe if I just strung that around my neck and just sort of looked like a musician, but preached, if y'all wouldn't get after it. I just, just the thought, I'm sorry. I just, my ADD takes me to places I didn't plan to go. 
And then he says he'll prepare you for every good work. He said not walking in craftiness, that is not deceitful, not willing to do anything to achieve his goals. So I wrote this statement. This passage speaks of both the character of the ministry, it's glorious, and the character of the minister, he's godly. Boy, that is a great marriage there. God has given New Springs a glorious ministry and a godly minister. And you put those two together and there is no tellings what all God may do. Number two, there's a commitment to the word of God. It says he's not handling, adulterating the word of God deceitful. In other words, he's not falsifying the word of God. He wants the word of God to be applied to his personal life. And then it'll be more effective when he applies it in his preaching life. So he's not guilty of giving wrong emphasis or withholding significant parts of truth. It means he he doesn't dilute God's word. He, He doesn't try to make it palatable so people can feel better in their sin. We're we're doing no one a favor there. You know, in the last few years, we've had some big issues to tackle. As ministers, uh, I did this series and Mark did the same thing, but we put up this website and we said, what, what do you wish Pastor Johnny would address? And boy, I mean, they, they pick the hottest items. When you preach those, you have to be careful about your demeanor, your facial expressions. You have to just pray, God, help me because I'm so passionate. I can come across like I'm angry and I'm not angry. I'm just fired up. I mean, really, I really am. I'm just uh, passionate about what God has given me to say. So Stephen Olford taught me this truth. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you know that some of the issues we may choose to address are out of season? And so people aren't really drawn into them. There's not any like hostility But how about when you preach on those issues that are in season, hot topics in the media? And and how about they call us bigots or narrow-minded preacher because we take a stand to tell you not what we think, but what he said. Therefore, we refuse to falsify truth. And so... Mark, I call Mark and say, Mark, I'm dealing with this issue. Have you dealt with it yet? Send me that sermon. (laughs) Somebody said one time when they heard we were being helped so much by other each other's sermons, said that's plagiarism. I said, that's not plagiarism. It's survival. (laughs) So he's faithful to the word. Someone just skip that, skip that. Let me just wrap it up with this part. I was thinking one day, and I journal a good bit, so I just had my journal out this morning, and I I have a thought. I wrote it down, so I really got to thinking that um, a lot of the strongest words in the human vocabulary end with I-T-Y, itty. And so then I went a step further, and I wrote, there's a lot of itty-bitty words that carry great weight. Can I give you a couple? And we'll close with this. Humility. And and I was writing these, and I wrote these thinking about my friend Mark. Uh, Humility is a low view of one's own own importance. It's the virtue of Jesus. Uh, A man that influenced um, every preacher in America's life. It's a guy by the name of Warren Wiersbe. W. 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 Warren W. Wiersbe. And Warren Wiersbe died this past year. Now, I don't know, but for some reason it gives me a great deal of pleasure to quote people that I knew that have helped me that are recently passed. Before he died, he did a study on this question. Did Jesus, from his own lips, mention anything about his own character traits? And Warren Wiersbe said this, he did not say that he's the love of God, John said that, God is love. He did not say he was holy, Peter said that. 
But he did say in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, I am meek and lowly, learn of me. The only trait, character trait, that Jesus mentioned from his own lips in his earthly ministry about himself was humility. And listen to this. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, the death of the cross. If it were not for the humility of Jesus, we would not have a way to be forgiven. What better way to honor the one who died for us than to pray each day, God, clothe me in humility, knowing that's voluntary subjection that I could get low enough. The Bible says, humble yourself, listen to this, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. God has convicted me before that he can't use me as much as he'd like to because I won't get low enough. I've got to get under the mighty hand of God for him to use me. Number two is integrity. And this is a good place to stop. When the tongue in your shoe and the tongue in your mouth are going in the same direction. That's integrity. Integrity's attributes is being gracious, valuing others, being honest, trustworthy, hardworking, responsible, helpful, and patient. And that's what it spoke into my life. I, I, got, I said I was going to quit, but remember I like to quit. So, Inability. Inability? Yeah, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. Why? Because Spurgeon said it well. We can no more change a life than we can create a star. We have no ability to change anyone. I don't care if I can be engaging. If people listen to me, only Jesus Christ can change a life forever. And we're looking to him to do it. So in closing, watching online in this room, do you know him? Has there been a time in your life where you said something like this? Lord Jesus, I need you. I cannot save myself. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. Cleanse me. Save me. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And thank you for saving me. Now help me to spend the rest of my life serving you. And help me to never be ashamed of knowing you. Could you make that your prayer? And personally, by faith, trust Christ to be your Lord and Savior. If that's your prayer, and you've prayed something like that in your life, we have a gift for you, whether you're watching online or in the room. And when they showed me this gift, they said, hey, uh, just tell anyone that prayed to receive Christ, God did a work in your heart, and you recommitted yourself to the Lord, just text the word prayed, P-R-A-Y-E-D, to 97,000, and they'll send this to you. Or when you leave this room, stop by their center, their Connect Center there, and they will give this to you. I, I, I opened it and I said, wow, there was a really nice Bible. So in fact, I think I'm going to take this one home with me. And, uh, and then there's a journal in here. And there's a devotion in here and some other items. And I thought, what a great gift. And literally over 100,000 have been given away. But there's one there for you. Hey, let me say thank you on behalf of Janet and myself for allowing us to spend this weekend with you. Really appreciate the opportunity. What, what an honor, Mark and Mary Alice, to be asked to preach for you. I was sitting there in this service in particular uh, thanking God. You even invited me to ordain both of your sons. I preached the ordination service of both of your sons. So you've so honored us in our friendship, and I deeply love you. Look forward to seeing each of you, Lord willing, tonight 
at 6.30. And would you do this with me? This would be a good way for us to leave. Would you join me one more time in saying thank you to Mark and Mary Alice Hoover for 35 years. Thank you.